Get this and get it straight. Crime's a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This one had soft brown eyes and an accent, and she came to town with a job to do. But before it was done, death had struck three times. Then she was gone. And all because of 30 drops of pigeon's blood, worth 150,000 bucks. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Pigeon's Blood. Five o'clock of any weekday afternoon. The lobby of the started building in downtown Los Angeles is a mess of milling office workers. So I was ten impolite minutes peering into chattering faces before I found my new client, Charlene Danielle. When she'd called me an hour ago, her slight French accent had been coated with worry as she identified herself as an illustrator for a fashion magazine with offices in the building and said that she needed help. She was huddled in a shadowed far corner of the lobby like a frightened puppy going through his first thunderstorm. When I was close to her, she stepped into the light and hurriedly took my arm. I am glad you didn't disappoint me, Mr. Marlowe. Come along, please, quickly. There's a bar just across the lobby where we can talk. All right. Come along, please. It's already late. Soft, lustrous hair that was shingled into a thousand short curls which kept running into one another framed a beautiful face and a wisp of a smile that never seemed to leave her lips labeled her gentle people. I couldn't quite get over it. When we were inside the bar and seated at the table, she was still talking. And I was still thinking how lovely she was. Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe, are you listening? Hmm? Oh, yes, of course I am. Yes. Now, what I want you to do is simple but very, very important. It, it must be done at once. It's... Easy, easy, honey. That's not going to help any. Now, one step at a time. What is it, Charlie? I'm sorry. It's a terrible man named Marty Loomis. He lives here in Los Angeles on North Rossmore Street, number 7710, mm -hmm. a private house. He is the one who had the collection stolen from Vivian's father. I know hey, he hey, is... Hey, 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 wait a minute. Whoa, slow around the corners, huh? Now, first of all, what's the collection of? Rubies, Mr. Marlowe. Rare pigeon's blood rubies. Uh -huh. Exquisite ones. The 30 of them worth at least, the very least, $150,000. Hmm. Tell me, are all the rubies as lovely as you are? Please, Mr. Marlowe. Okay, okay. Who's Vivian? My best friend, the girl I grew up with in Lyon. She's still in France, but I got out before the war to Mexico and Penada. Mm -hmm. Some friends at the Riviera Pacifico helped me to get to California. Vivian and her father, Maurice Chardot, uh, an old man now, they lost everything they had, family, a home, their business, and then they had only the rubies left. Which should bring us to this guy Loomis, huh? It does. Mr. Marlowe, he was in France only last month, a guest in the Chardot home. A charming American businessman who was going to buy the rubies. But it just wouldn't say when. Tell me, Charlene, did anybody actually see him take the stones? No, but no. there's no doubt that he did it, Mr. Marlowe. He was one of the few persons who knew where Monsieur Jardot kept them. What about the police? Oh, no, no, Mr. Marlowe, not yet. Only when we know that Loomis still has the stones, when we know where the rubies are. You see, any hurried arrest would only mean that the jewels would be gotten rid of, gone forever. Why isn't Vivian here, uh, Monsieur Jardot? I told you. He is an old man, a broken man, and they are penniless. The rubies were going to be sold. That's why this, this Loomis was visiting with them. Now, please, Mr. Marlowe, can you do this for me? Can you find out where the jewels are? It, it would mean so much if we can return them. So much. Yeah. Where can I find you later, Charlene? I live at the Bradford Arms. The telephone number is Sunset 10229. 10229. Now, hmm? now, what is your fee, please? Well, I... <laughs> we'll talk about it later, huh? All right. You are kind. I, I only hope that later isn't too far away. For Monsieur Jardot's sake? Why, why yes, for, for everybody's sake. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, somehow or another, I managed to stop at all the red lights and go on all the green ones and not hit anyone all the way from downtown L.A. where I'd left Charlene up into Hollywood and over to Marty Loomis' house at 7710 North Rossmore. Parking a half a block away, I stood looking at the rambling white house, vintage 1915. I was startled into action by a wiry, white-haired old boy in search of a match. After a quick servicing job, I moved up to the door. As I knocked on the massive display of aging oak, I decided that Marlowe should play the role of crooked jeweler to ease the entrance. But when the door finally opened and an ox in shiny blue surge answered, I wasn't too happy with my choice of roles. A big club would have been better. Yeah? What do you want? Marty Loomis. Is he in? Who's asking questions? Uh, the name's Becker. A mutual friend recommended me to him. Does uh, Lefty know about this? He should. Why don't you ask him? Okay. Come on in. Relax while I find out. Thanks. Any place in particular? Yeah. Flat on your back, oh! big mouth. And don't bother going for your gun. I'll, I'll do it for you. Ah. Nice 38 at that. Now your wallet. <laughs> Lefty. <laughs> Thought you were picking up your cue fast, didn't you, Mr... Oh, Marlowe, huh? Private detective. What were you thinking about when you bit, Big Mouth? Something nice and calico? You're warm, Buster. My mistake. Where do we go from here? You? No place. Till I make a phone call. Excuse me. Big jerk. Westwood 9903. Yeah. My, my number? Uh, Gladstone, uh, 2742. This won't take long, Marlowe, then you and I can... Uh... Oh, hello, Tony. Oh, it's Chalky. No, no, I looked every place. No, honey, I, I tell you the stuff just ain't here, but something else is. A private dick named Marlowe. Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, probably one of that stinking Slater's boys. But you don't have to worry about Marlowe. So long, babe. Your mother, Chalky? Listen, Louse, I got one question to ask you, and I want a straight answer fast. Are you working for Zig Slater? I don't remember. Well, that's too bad. You know, I might have to get nasty if you don't cooperate. Doesn't much make any difference whether I cooperate or not. Let's face it, huh, Chalky? All right. Let's do it! Oh, just... Ah! Big mouth. By the time I sorted my legs out from those that belonged to the coffee table, Chalky was gone. But in his wake, there were three things that a very fast, superficial search revealed. My gun in the hall outside empty, next to the door my wallet intact, and near the overturned coffee table, a pawn ticket from the Ryan Loan Company, corner Hill and Eighth. A receipt for one gray top coat, right sleeve ripped, allowing $7.50. I dropped it into my pocket, then put through a call to one lieutenant he borrowed, police headquarters. In a few minutes, I knew that Zig Slater was a fence who had done time twice on stolen property charges and at present could be found in or around a shop on La Cienega Boulevard near Melrose, where he sold, of all things, tropical fish. I hung up and started out of the door of my car. But in less than 50 feet, I knew I wasn't alone. My shadow was the shock of white hair who earlier had stopped me for a match. It was his turn to be surprised when I suddenly wheeled, grabbed at both his lapels, and shook. Well, 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 what are you doing? No rumba, Pop. Believe me, I just want to rearrange your marbles. No, no, so that when you start talking, it comes out straight. Now, no, why are you following me? And don't tell me you need me another match. Come on. I, I, I'm calling you because I, I, I want to warn you. About what? Uh, a giant of a man I just saw near your car. In a beat up loose surge, maybe? Yeah, 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 that's right. You see, I, I live across the street, and after you gave me that match, I took my regular evening walk. But when I got back, I, I saw this man, this, this giant. He, he was going to let the air out of your tires, I know, but I stopped him. Yes, sir. I yelled at him real loud, and he ran away. He, he cursed me first. Oh, now, now, aren't you sorry you shook me like you did? Yeah, I am. I'd let you shake me back, but there isn't time, Pop. Well, no matter, fella. I guess I can figure it all right. I mean, the way you're acting must be a beautiful girl behind this someplace. Always is, right? Right. Just to make sure she stays that way, you'll excuse me, but I got to see a man about some tropical fish. So long, Pop. <laughs> Zig Slater's place on La Cienega was three walls, lined almost solid with bubbling tanks that were home for the kind of screwy-looking fish that made you wonder what they could possibly see with a bad case of DTs. 
Slater was small and slight with black darting eyes that were too large for the rest of his face, which was prune-winkled, shaped like a Coke bottle and had all the come-hither look of an octopus. He was on the phone. It wasn't until I was close enough to hear the number he was after that I Operator. was glad he was having Operator, trouble. Operator, that was the wrong number. Because it was the same digit arrangement that Hello? Chalky had called earlier. And operator. prefixed Westwood as well. No, operator, I did not call 9933. It was Westwood 9903. That's right. All three, yeah. Stupid people. Hello, Toby. It's Ziggy, darling. Where have you been? I've tried to reach you half a dozen times. A walk, oh. oh. Well, look, baby, you meet me over at... Wait a minute. Lost something, mister? Uh, why, yes. yes. As a matter of fact, I have. One of my twin uh, uh, sword tails died. I was just admiring yours here. I'd, I'd like to buy one. I'll be right with you. Oh. Uh, meet me at the blue chip in 30 minutes, huh, sweet? Now, don't worry, I'm, I'm a little bit late. I got a few things to do first. Right. Goodbye, baby. Uh, sword tails, mister, are $1.10, $1.35, and $1.80. What'll it be? What? They started $1.10? Uh-huh. At the last place, I only paid 90 cents for a sword tail. Good one, too. Then maybe you'd better go back to the last place, huh? Well, maybe I had. Good night, sir. And I was outside in my car and pointed toward the blue chip, which was an ex-speakeasy on Santa Monica Boulevard that had quite never gotten over it. I knew that I had something to work on before it was time to call Charlene and report that so far I had located neither the Rubies nor Marty Loomis. With luck, I could have words with Toby at the blue chip before Slater arrived. So 20 minutes later, when I was there and seated at an all-alone table for two, drink in front of me, I looked up at the sound of high heels clicking toward me and the five and a half feet of blonde who grew out of them in wraparound suede. When I called Toby by name and she pivoted like she was built on a hinge, I was back in business. I don't know you. What do you want? If it's handy, Chalky's telephone number. Chalk... You're Marlowe, aren't you? Yes, and private detective you ordered bounced around. Now, let's not waste any more of each other's time, Toby. Where's Marty Loomis? Oh, sorry. I never heard of him. Or the pigeon blood rubies? Who are you working for, Marlo? Don't you remember? I'm one of Slater's boys. You're a liar. Not a double-crosser, Toby. But, well, what do you mean by that? And when you're on the phone with Chalky, Brother Ziggy is referred to as the stinking Slater. But when Slater's on with you, it's sugar and spice all the way around. Which means what? That you're not even close to being on the level with one of them. I discount Chalky because his kind, you hire, pay, and forget. When the job's done, Marlowe, so behave. He's right outside that back door. It's a little thoughtless of you, isn't it, Toby? The lad's top coats in hockey might catch cold. That I'd hate to see. I'll bet. Now look, Marlowe, once more. What are you after? One rubies, two Marty Loomis. And if I can't help you find either of them? Then I go to Slater. On whose behalf? My client, who represents the real owner of the stones. Named what? It escapes me, Toby. Let's just call her a lovely lady from France, huh? From France? Hmm. <laughs> For a minute, I thought you were on the side of law and order. What says different? Marty Loomis is dead, Marlowe. Has been all night in the closet of his study at 7710 North Rossmore. What? And just so you don't miss the point, one thing more, I found the body. But first, outside, I found something else. Running away, it was a girl, Marlowe. A girl with a French accent. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, for those who delight in the fast action and faster thinking that thwart the evildoer, CBS brings you three outstanding examples every Sunday. The Green Llama brings you the adventures of wealthy young Jethro Dumont, who uses his knowledge of the mysterious East to combat evil doings on this side of the Pacific. Call the Police summons Police Commissioner Bill Grant to trail the objectionable offender and bring him to justice. Sam Spade, well, what need to enlarge upon the extraordinary exploits of Dashiell Hammett's brilliant private eye, hero of the Maltese Falcon, and many other crime classics. You can find these thrilling examples of mystery, adventure, delight every Sunday on most of these CBS stations. And now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Pigeon's Blood. When Toby said French accent, it rocked me right back on my heels. I stood there with my mouth open, trying to reconcile death in a closet with the soft, deep brown of Charlene's eyes. While the blonde in front of me twisted her mouth into a victorious smile as tender as a cobra's. 
I got up and went out the front way, dragging what was left of my pride behind me. I had to know the truth about Charlene, so I called her. She answered on the first ring, and I made my pitch. I said I thought I knew where the rubies were hidden and told her to meet me at 7710 Rossmore. Then I drove to Rossmore and waited, and five minutes later, a cab stopped down the street, and she got out. So I went to meet her. Marlo, is that you? Yeah. Come on, this way, Charlene. Are they here, Marlo? In, in this house, the rubies, I mean. We'll find out, baby. Come on. But you Side said door's that... open. I said I wasn't sure, and I'm not. About a lot of things. Here, watch the stairs. You should lead to the study. Yes. You still with me? I'm coming. Yeah. This is it. Oh. Okay, Charlene. Now, if I've been lied to, this is the place to check. We'll start with that closet there. The, the closet? Yes, open it up. Go on, open it. All right. I... No, no, I can't. I you can't, can't because I you can't. already know what's inside, don't you? Well, I'll open it for no, you. No, 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 no. Oh. oh I, I didn't do it. I didn't You knew he was there, so he must have been in here before. Yes. Yes, I was. I admit it. I tried to see Lomas myself this afternoon. I-, I followed him downtown, but I lost him. When I got back here, I came in and I, I found him like that. I-, I didn't know what to do. I-, I called you, but then I lied to you because I was afraid. And you're still afraid, so maybe you're still lying. No, no, this time is the truth, I swear. All of it? it. You're not holding anything back? I- no, no, that's all of it. Oh, Phil, please don't force me. Please, you must trust yeah. What was that? What was what? I thought I heard a door close. I, I must be jumpy. I guess... May I have a cigarette? Yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, you, you dropped something. Hmm? Why, why, it's a pawn ticket. Oh. Yeah, it's my brains. Can't you tell? The Ryan Loan Company, corner Hill Street and 8th. At Hill and 8th. Don't worry about it, Charlene. It's not mine. Belongs to a guy named Chalky, who had to hock his winter wardrobe to keep himself in hamburgers. Forget it. You want that cigarette or not? Not now. Come on, Phil. Let's get out of this room. Come on, please. I... Phil. There is someone here. A shadow moved on that wall over the back hall. Hey, you're right. Now, listen, you beat it out that side door. Go back to your hotel and wait there. I'll see who this is. I want to stay with you. Oh, now get out of here. Hurry, hurry. Be careful, Shirley. All right, creep, crawl out of the woodwork. Come on. I know you're present because you left your shadow sticking out. Right about here. Ow! Well, well. Slimy little sword tail salesman himself. (laughs) What are you doing here? Well, I'll tell you, Marlowe, I'm just So you got my name, too, huh? And more. From a short talk with a platinum blonde named Toby. Who are you fencing for, Slater? Her or Loomis? Fencing? You find things out, don't you? Well, I didn't want to do it. I've been going straight since I got paroled, but legitimate business has been lousy. So when Loomis wanted you to arrange a deal, you took him up, huh? Yeah, but right away it got too hot. I had it all set until that blonde started cutting in on Loomis. I don't go for that. Nobody's got a chance in a double cross. For instance... I know what's in the closet, see? And Toby's the one that put him there. She told me. Toby killed him? Did she have the stones? I don't know. I guess so. Because she was trying to make me go through with the deal. But I turned her down. Then I had to sap that gorilla Chalky to get away. Ah, it's good, but it won't fit, Slater. Why'd you come back here? To clean up the joint. With my record, all it would take is for my phone number, even my initials to turn up here and I'm cooked. Where does Toby live? If I tell you, will you give me a break? You'll tell me anyway and fast, or I'll give you a break on the side of your head. Let's have a talk. Okay, okay. 3156 South Ogden Drive, Apartment C. Now, how about it, pal? Will you forget you saw me here? You louse, you're whining because things got tough. If they hadn't, you'd be getting calluses from counting money. You're a crummy spider, Slater, so stay out of my way. Because next time we meet, I'll step on you. The little man rolled his big head up at me and grinned. I looked at it a minute, then shoved it hard to one side and walked out. The way things stood, I figured the next move, which was mine, had to be first a call to the police to report Loomis' murder, and second a fast pressure play on a faster blonde named Toby. But I was wrong on both counts because I was halfway to my car when I found out the next move wasn't mine at all. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught a shadow easing toward me under the cover of the hedge. It was the white-haired duffer again, and the setup was just like before. So I saw no reason why the same maneuver wouldn't work twice. I slowed down to give him plenty of time. When I was sure he was right behind me, I turned fast and swung <laughs> at thin air. How many times do you think you can pull that stunt, son? Okay, it was my mistake. Yes, it was. And don't move because my gun goes off. I want to ask you a few things. I don't feel talkative. Who are you? And what's your racket, son? Philip Marlowe, private detective. What's yours? That doesn't happen to be any of your business, son. Let's just say I'm looking for one Vivian Jardot. Happen to know where she is? Vivian Jardot? Sure. Right now, she's in France, Lyon, to be specific. Yeah, she's in France right now, like you're in Madagascar. Save yourself trouble, son. Where is she? 
You know, you wouldn't know the truth if it fell on you. What's your angle, Marlowe? Oh, come on. Let's not be coy. It's the same as yours, a fistful of rubies. <laughs> well, now, you don't say. And I suppose that's why Vivian Jardot's been following Loomis around all afternoon. Vivian again? You won't turn loose, will you? Now, listen, son. The Jardot dame is here in town. I happen to know she hopped off a Norwegian freighter. I finally picked her up right here. She was tagging Loomis, and I tagged her. We played Ring Around the Rosie clear downtown. I lost them in a traffic jam, but I picked up Loomis again for a few minutes at the corner of Hill and 8. The Jardot girl, minute, I lost... Wait a minute. Pla- Did you say Loomis was at Hill and 8? Yes, that's right. Why? Because I know a guy who gives six bucks for a gray top coat on that corner. So what? So well, whoever said you can't teach an old dog new tricks was nuts! It wasn't! That one's called slap the pistol and bust the old geezer. Sorry, Pop, it had to be. I got business it won't keep. So long! <laughs> And my car piled in and headed down Wiltshire Boulevard wide open. Because any way I looked at it, Ryan's porn parlor at Hill and 8th was home plate. And in the time I'd spent gabbing with Pop, there was a good chance that blood was already being spilled on an old gray top coat with a lining full of rubies. And when I remembered Charlene had walked out with a pawn ticket for that coat in her hand, I got a little sick. When I got to Hill and 8th, I spotted Ryan's place squeezed into a four-foot crevice between two tall buildings and dark inside. I cut my lights parked, reloaded my thirty-eight, and walked up the alley to the back door was standing open a foot, and inside a flashlight was lying on a table while moving in and out of its beam as she clawed through a rack of second-hand topcoats was Charlene. Had her feet face up on the floor with a nasty gash over one eye, was a man who no doubt used to answer to the name of Ryan. I eased the door open another foot and went in. I got as far as the glow of light before she saw me. Phil! Oh, no, no, Why'd you slug him, honey? You had the ticket? You could have just... She didn't slug him, Marlowe. I did. Slater. Yeah, don't turn around. Just toss your gun back here. Come on. That's it. Well, that takes care of everybody now. We're all here so we can get back to work. Aren't you forgetting Toby and her trained ape? No, Toby can't make it. And Chalky won't without her. She can't make it because she's dead. I found a nice closet for her, too. Oh, I told you a fib when I said she killed Loomis. I did that for both of them. Because they were double-crossing me. They were cutting me out of my own deal, and they were laughing about it. I can't stand to have people laugh at me. It's my fault, Phil. I, I didn't wait for you. When I, when I realized that Loomis swear had pawned the coat and not that chalky, I, I was sure that he had hidden the rubies in it for safekeeping. So I came here and now... And so at... did I, and I caught her. Then I set a little trap for the big, strong man who steps on little spiders. Now you, which coat is it? This one? No! I don't oh, know. so it is this one. Well, give it to me. No, no, you can't take it. Stay away from me. Give you... me that. Charlene, don't be a fool. Let him have the coat. No, the rubies in it are mine. They belong to my father. I came halfway around the world to get them and to take them home, and I won't give them up to this, this grotesque, ugly what? little man. What did I you won't. say? Why, no, you... Get out. No! Slater. He's hit, but... He sure is, son. The door here was as open as an invitation to the old-timers' picnic. I've been listening. Now, don't move now, either one of you. I've still got some business with Miss Vivian Jardot. Hey, come back here! Charlie! You missed. That's your last chance, believe me, you trigger-happy jerk. She's out the door. Stand aside, son. I've got to get that girl. I don't think so. Whose car is that out there? Yours? Yeah, with a full tank of gas. What are you grinning about? Okay, son, she's gone. Girl, coat, and rubies. Got away from both of us, didn't she? And from the look on your face, you're not quite sure whether you've lost... A one. Two hectic hours jammed with phone calls, police reports on Toby and Chalky, and long-winded conversation in general went by before the whole mess of dovetailed motives and overlapping authority was straightened out, to the point where Detective Lieutenant Ibarra decided to get along without us and turn me in, my white-haired pal, who who I blush to discover was one Sam Harris, 20 years an officer with the Immigration Service, loose on the town again. In Sam's car, we threaded through the traffic. Big night, wasn't it, son? Yeah. You know, Sam, you should have told me who you were and saved yourself that swollen jaw. Yeah, that's all right. In a mix-up like this one was, a few loose teeth are better than a loose tongue any day. All I knew was that Vivian Jardot was an alien who jumped ship. I didn't know a thing about those rubies until I was right in the middle of it. She just made up the whole story, huh? About being Charlene Danielle and working here as an illustrator? That's right. What are you going to do about her, Harris? 
Well, son, as it works out, I'm on her side now. How's that? She wants to get back to France, and it's my job to see that she does. There won't be any trouble. You know, she's a crazy kid to try what she did alone. Mm. But she made up her mind to get her rubies back, and she did. Yeah. She's pretty, too. Or did you happen to notice? Mm-mm. You're not listening. I was looking at that medal you got there on your keychain. Pistol marksmanship champion, New York service range. You know, Harris, when you shot at Charlene tonight, you Now, were... uh, wait a minute, son. Mm-hmm. It was dark, and that medal is ten years old. <laughs> Besides, it's not polite to put a man in a spot where he has to argue with his conscience. Mm, my mistake. Well, there's your car exactly where I said it'd be. Right across from the airline passenger gate. Someone who had to make a plane in a hurry must have borrowed it. Amazing, isn't it? Good night, Marlowe. See you again, Sam. And thanks. When Harris drove away, I walked over to my car and got in. But I didn't start up right away. Instead, I just sat there and thought of a plane fading off somewhere in the night. And a girl from France with soft brown eyes. And remembered that I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye. But then I saw it. The note stuck over the ignition key, scribbled on an old envelope in hurried pencil. All it said was, Someday, Sherry. Someday. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Alma Lawton, Edgar Barrier, Gloria Blondell, Herb Butterfield, and Barney Phillips. The special music is by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... Easy money is a sucker's racket. This time it started as a routine search for a rich girl's fiancé. And the trail led to a silent house haunted by a face at the window and blood in an open cedar chest. But before it was over, it became a quest for a corpse that wouldn't sit still. Oh, will he be in France? The lady took a chance. Hilo, the Dane, will show. Who could resist romance? You'll be hearing four short lines sung sweetly later tonight, and to some bright, lucky CBS listener, they'll be the key to $50,000 in prizes and cash. It's the new Phantom Voice song on CBS's sensational Saturday Night Sing It Again program, an hour-long bonanza of prizes, music, and gaiety. Phone calls go out to all the nation asking CBS listeners to solve gay little riddle songs. And for those who guess these riddles, it means a chance at the $50,000 Phantom Award. $25,000 in super prizes for solving the Phantom's identity. $25,000 more in cold cash for answering only one more question about the Phantom. Listen closely when Sing It Again comes to you on most of these same CBS network stations just a little later this evening. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>